This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Natural History of Selborne by Gilbert White. Letters to Thomas Pennant, Numbers 1 to 6. Letter 1. The parish of Selborne lies in the extreme eastern corner of the county of Hampshire, bordering on the county of Sussex, and not far from the county of Surrey. It is about fifty miles southwest of London, in latitude fifty-one, and near midway between the towns of Alton and Petersfield. Being very large and extensive, it abuts on twelve parishes, two of which are in Sussex, that is, Trotton and Rogate. If you begin from the south and proceed westward, the adjacent parishes are Emshot, Newton Valence, Farringdon, Hartley Mordwit, Great Ward Le Ham, Kingsley, Headley, Bramshot, Trotton, Rogate, Lissa, and Greatham. The soils of this district are almost as various and diversified as the views and aspects. The high part to the southwest consists of a vast hill of chalk, rising three hundred feet above the village, and is divided into a sheep down, the high wood, and a long hanging wood called the hanger. The covert of this eminence is altogether beech, the most lovely of all forest trees, whether we consider its smooth rind or bark, its glossy foliage, or graceful pendulous boughs. The down or sheep walk is a pleasing park-like spot of about one mile by half that space, jutting out on the verge of the hill country, where it begins to break down into the plains, and commanding a very engaging view, being an assemblage of hill, dale, woodlands, heath, and water. The prospect is bounded to the south-east and east by the vast range of mountains called the Sussex Downs, by Guild Down near Guildford, and by the Downs round Dorking, and Reigate in Surrey to the north-east, which altogether, with the country beyond Alton and Farnham, form a noble and extensive outline. At the foot of this hill, one stage or step from the uplands, lies the village, which consists of one single straggling street, three-quarters of a mile in length, in a sheltered vale and running parallel with the hangar. The houses are divided from the hill by a vein of stiff clay, good wheatland, yet stand on a rock of white stone, little in appearance removed from chalk, but seems so far from being calcareous that it endures extreme heat. Yet that the freestone still preserves somewhat that is analogous to chalk is plain from the beaches, which descend as low as those rocks extend and no farther, and thrive as well on them, where the ground is steep, as on the chalks. The cartway of the village divides in a remarkable manner two very incongruous soils. To the southwest is a rank clay that requires the labour of years to render it mellow, while the gardens to the northeast, and small enclosures behind, consist of a warm, forward, crumbling mould called black malm, which seems highly saturated with vegetable and animal manure, and these may perhaps have been the original site of the town, while the wood and coverts might extend down to the opposite bank. At each end of the village, which runs from south-east to north-west, arises a small rivulet. That at the north-west end frequently fails, but the other is a fine perennial spring little influenced by drought or wet seasons, called Wellhead. Footnote added by Gilbert White. This spring produced, September the 14th, 1781, after a severe hot summer and a preceding dry spring and winter, nine gallons of water in a minute, which is 540 in an hour, and 12,960 or 216 hogsheads in 24 hours or one natural day. At this time many of the wells failed, 
and all the ponds in the vales were dry. Return to text. The spring breaks out of some high grounds joining to Cor Hill, a noble chalk promontory, remarkable for sending forth two streams into two different seas. The one to the south becomes a branch of the Arran, running to Arundel, and so falling into the British Channel, the other to the north. The Selborne stream makes one branch of the way, and meeting the Blackdown stream at Headley, and the Alton and Farnham stream at Tilford Bridge, swells into a considerable river, navigable at Godalming, from whence it passes to Guildford, and so into the Thames at Weybridge, and thus at the Nore into the German Ocean. Our wells, at an average, run to about sixty-three feet, and when sunk to that depth, seldom fail, but produce a fine, limpid water, soft to the taste, and much commended by those who drink the pure element, but which does not lather well with soap. To the north-west, north and east of the village, is a range of fair enclosures, consisting of what is called a white malm, a sort of rotten or rubble stone which, when turned up to the frost and rain, moulders to pieces and becomes manure to itself. Footnote inserted by Gilbert White. This soil produces good wheat and clover. Return to text. Still on to the north-east, and a step lower, is a kind of white land, neither chalk nor clay, neither fit for pasture nor for the plough, yet kindly for hops, which root deep into the freestone, and have their poles, and wood for charcoal, growing just at hand. This white soil produces the brightest hops. As the parish still inclines down towards Walmer Forest, at the juncture of the clays and sand the soil becomes a wet, sandy loam, remarkable for timber, and infamous for roads. The oaks of Temple and Blackmoor stand high in the estimation of purveyors, and have furnished much naval timber, while the trees on the freestone grow large, but are what workmen call shaky, and so brittle as often to fall to pieces in sawing. Beyond the sandy loam the soil becomes an hungry, lean sand, till it mingles with the forest, and will produce little without the assistance of lime and turnips. Letter 2 to Thomas Pennant, Esquire In the court of Norton Farmhouse, a manor farm to the north-west of the village, on the white malms, stood within these twenty years a broad-leaved elm, or witch-hazel, Almus folio latissimo scabro of Ray, which, though it had lost a considerable leading bough in the great storm in the year 1703, equal to a moderate tree, yet when felled contained eight loads of timber, and being too bulky for a carriage, was sawn off at seven feet above the butt, where it measured near eight feet in the diameter. This elm I mention to show to what a bulk planted elms may attain, as this tree must certainly have been such from its situation. In the centre of the village, and near the church, is a square piece of ground surrounded by houses, and vulgarly called the Plester. In the midst of this spot stood in old times a vast oak, with a short squat body and huge horizontal arms extending almost to the extremity of the area. This venerable tree, surrounded with stone steps and seats above them, was the delight of old and young and a place of much resort in summer evenings, where the former sat in grave debate, while the latter frolicked and danced before them. Long might it have stood, had not the amazing tempest in 1703 overturned it at once, to the infinite regret of the inhabitants, and the vicar, who bestowed several pounds in setting it in its place again, but all his care could not avail. The tree sprouted for a time, then withered and died. This oak I mention to show to what a bulk planted oaks also may arrive, and planted this tree must certainly have been, as will appear from what will be said farther concerning this area, 
when we enter on the antiquities of Selborne. On the Blackmore estate there is a small wood called Losels, of a few acres, that was lately furnished with a set of oaks of a peculiar growth, and great value. They were tall and taper-like firs, but standing near together had very small heads, only a little brush, without any large limbs. About twenty years ago the bridge at the Toy, near Hampton Court, being much decayed, some trees were wanted for repairs that were fifty feet long without bough, and would measure twelve inches diameter at the little end. Twenty such trees did a purveyor find in this little wood, with this advantage that many of them answered the description at sixty feet. These trees were sold for twenty pounds apiece. In the centre of this grove there stood an oak, which, though shapely and tall on the whole, bulged out into a large excrescence about the middle of the stem. On this a pair of ravens had fixed their residence for such a series of years that the oak was distinguished by the title of the raven tree. Many were the attempts of the neighbouring youths to get at this eyrie. The difficulty whetted their inclinations, and each was ambitious of surmounting the arduous task. But when they arrived at the swelling, it jutted out so in their way, and was so far beyond their grasp, that the most daring lads were awed, and acknowledged the undertaking to be too hazardous. So the ravens built on, nest upon nest, in perfect security, till the fatal day arrived in which the wood was to be levelled. It was in the month of February, when those birds usually sit. The saw was applied to the butt, the wedges were inserted into the opening, the woods echoed to the heavy blows of the beetle or mallet. The tree nodded to its fall, but still the dam sat on. At last, when it gave way, the bird was flung from her nest, and, though her parental affection deserved a better fate, was whipped down by the twigs, which brought her dead to the ground. Letter three to Thomas Pennant, Esquire the fossil shells of this district, and sorts of stone, such as have fallen within my observation, must not be passed over in silence. And first I must mention as a great curiosity a specimen that was ploughed up in the chalky fields near the side of the down, and given to me for the singularity of its appearance, which, to an incurious eye, seems like a petrified fish of about four inches long, the cardo passing for an head and mouth. It is in reality a bivalve of the Linnean genus of Mytilus, and the species of Christa Galli, called by Lister, Rastellum, by Rumphius, Ostrium plicatum minus, by D'Argenville, Auris porci, subspecies Christa Galli, and by those who make collections, Coxcomb. Though I applied to several such in London, I could never meet with an entire specimen nor could I ever find in books any engraving from a perfect one. In the superb museum at Leicester House, permission was given me to examine for this article, and though I was disappointed as to the fossil, I was highly gratified with the sight of several of the shells themselves in high preservation. This bivalve is only known to inhabit the Indian Ocean, where it fixes itself to a zoophyte, known by the name Gorgonia, the curious foldings of the suture, the one into the other, the alternate flutings or grooves, and the curved form of my specimen being much easier expressed by the pencil than by words, I have caused it to be drawn and engraved. Cornua ammonis are very common about this village. As we were cutting an inclining path up the hangar, the labourers found them frequently on that steep, just under the soil, in the chalk and of a considerable size. In the lane above Wellhead, in the way to Emshot, they abound in the bank, in a darkish sort of marl, and are usually very small and soft. But in Clay's Pond, a little farther on, at the end of the pit, where the soil is dug out for manure, I have occasionally observed them of large dimensions, perhaps fourteen or sixteen inches in diameter. But as these did not consist of firm stone, but were formed of a kind of terra lapidosa, or hardened clay, as soon as they were exposed to the rains and frost, they mouldered away. These seemed as if they were a very recent production. 
In the chalk pit at the northwest end of the hangar, large nautili are sometimes observed. In the very thickest strata of our freestone, and at considerable depths, well diggers often find large scallops or pectines, having both shells deeply striated and ridged and furrowed alternately. They are highly impregnated with, if not wholly composed of, the stone of the quarry. Letter 4 to Thomas Pennant, Esquire As in a former letter the freestone of this place has been only mentioned incidentally, I shall here become more particular. This stone is in great request for hearthstones and the beds of ovens, and in lining of lime-kilns it turns to good account, for the workmen use sandy loam instead of mortar, the sand of which fluxes and runs by the intense heat, and so cases over the whole face of the kiln with a strong vitrified coat, like glass, that it is well preserved from injuries of weather, and endures thirty or forty years. Footnote inserted by Gilbert White. There may probably be also in the chalk itself that is burnt for lime, a proportion of sand, for few chalks are so pure as to have none. Return to text. When chiselled smooth, the freestone makes elegant fronts for houses, equal in colour and grain to the bath stone, and superior in one respect, that when seasoned it does not scale. Decent chimney-pieces are worked from it of much closer and finer grain than Portland, and rooms are floored with it, but it proves rather too soft for this purpose. It is a freestone, cutting in all directions, yet has something of a grain parallel with the horizon, and therefore should not be sur-bedded, but laid in the same position as it grows in the quarry. Footnote inserted by Gilbert White To sur-bed stone is to set it edgewise, contrary to the posture it had in the quarry, said Dr. Plot, in Oxfordshire, page 77. But surbedding does not succeed in our dry walls, neither do we use it so in ovens, though he says it is best for taint and stone. Return to text. On the ground abroad this firestone will not succeed for pavements, because probably some degree of saltness prevailing within it the rain tears the slabs to pieces. Footnote inserted by Gilbert White. Firestone is full of salts and has no sulphur, must be close-grained and have no interstices. Nothing supports fire like salts. Saltstone perishes exposed to wet and frost. From Plots, Staffordshire, page 152. Return to text. Though this stone is too hard to be acted on by vinegar, yet both the white part and even the blue rag ferments strongly in mineral acids. Though the white stone will not bear wet, yet in every quarry at intervals there are thin strata of blue rag which resist rain and frost, and are excellent for pitching of stables, paths, and courts, and for building of dry walls against banks, a valuable species of fencing, much in use in this village and for mending of roads. This rag is rugged and stubborn, and will not hew to a smooth face, but is very durable, yet as these strata are shallow and lie deep, large quantities cannot be procured but at considerable expense. Among the blue rags turn up some blocks tinged with a stain of yellow or rust colour, which seem to be nearly as lasting as the blue, and every now and then balls of a friable substance like, like rust of iron, called rust balls. In Walmer Forest I see but one sort of stone, called by the workman sand or forest stone. This is generally of the colour of rusty iron, and might probably be worked as iron ore, is very hard and heavy, and of a firm compact texture, and composed of a small roundish crystalline grit cemented together by a brown, terrene, ferruginous matter, will not cut without difficulty, nor easily strike fire with steel. Being often found in broad flat pieces, it makes good pavement for paths about houses, never becoming slippery in frost or rain. It is excellent for dry walls, and is sometimes used in buildings. In many parts of that waste it lies scattered on the surface of the ground, but is dug on weaver's down 
a vast hill on the eastern verge of that forest, where the pits are shallow and the stratum thin. This stone is imperishable. From a notion of rendering their work the more elegant, and giving it a finish, Masons chip this stone into small fragments about the size of the head of a large nail, and then stick the pieces into the wet mortar along the joints of their freestone walls. This embellishment carries an odd appearance, and has occasioned strangers sometimes to ask us pleasantly whether we fastened our walls together with tempany nails. Letter 5 to Thomas Pennant, Esquire Among the singularities of this place, the two rocky hollow lanes, the one to Alton and the other to the forest, deserve our attention. These roads, running through the Moln lands, are by the traffic of ages and the fretting of water, worn down through the first stratum of our freestone, and partly through the second, so that they look more like water-courses than roads, and are bedded with naked rag for furlongs together. In many places they are reduced sixteen or eighteen feet beneath the level of the fields, and after floods and in frosts exhibit very grotesque and wild appearances from the tangled roots that are twisted among the strata, and from the torrents rushing down their broken sides, and especially when those cascades are frozen into icicles, hanging in all the fanciful shapes of frost-work. These rugged, gloomy scenes affright the ladies when they peep down into them from the paths above, and make timid horsemen shudder while they ride along them, but delight the naturalist with their various botany, and particularly with their curious filices with which they abound. The manor of Selborne, was it strictly looked after with its kindly aspects and all its sloping coverts, would swarm with game. Even now hares, partridges, and pheasants abound, and in old days woodcocks were as plentiful. There are few quails, because they more affect open fields than enclosures. After harvest some few land-rails are seen. The parish of Selborne, by taking in so much of the forest, is a vast district. Those who tread the bounds are employed part of three days in the business, and are of the opinion that the outline in all its curves and indentings does not comprise less than thirty miles. The village stands in a sheltered spot, secured by the hangar from the strong westerly winds. The air is soft, but rather moist from the effluvia of so many trees, yet perfectly healthy and free from agues. The quantity of rain that falls on it is very considerable, as may be supposed in so woody and mountainous a district. As my experience in measuring the water is but of short date, I am not qualified to give the mean quantity. Footnote inserted by Gilbert White A very intelligent gentleman assures me, and he speaks from upward of forty years' experience, that the mean rain of any place cannot be ascertained till a person has measured it for a very long period. If I had only measured the rain, says he, for the first four years from 1740 to 1743, I should have said that the mean rain at Linden was sixteen and a half inches for the year. If from 1740 to 1750, eighteen and a half inches. The mean rain before 1763 was twenty and a quarter, from 1763 and since, twenty-five and a half. From 1770 to 1780, twenty-six. If only 1773, 1774 and 1775 had been measured, Linden mean rain would have been called thirty-two inches. Return to text. Reader's Note the following is a summary of a table of the author's rainfall data. I only know that from May the 1st, 1779, to the end of the year, there fell 28 inches. In the complete year 1780, 27, in 1781, 30, in 1782, 50, in 1783, 33, in 1784, 33, in 1785, 31, and in 1786, 39. 
reader's note. In the previous table, an odd measurement, the hund, has been removed to make the table more comprehensible. Return to text. The village of Selborne, and large hamlet of Oak Hanger, with the single farms, and many scattered houses along the verge of the forest, contain upwards of six hundred and seventy inhabitants. Footnote. A state of the parish of Selborne, taken October the 4th, 1783, gives the following figures. Reader's Note. The author, Gilbert White, died about nine years and eight months later, in June 1793. End of Reader's Note. The number of tenements or families, 136. The number of inhabitants in the street is 313. In the rest of the parish, 363. Total, 676. Near five inhabitants to each tenement. In the time of the Reverend Gilbert White, vicar, reader's note, the author's grandfather, end of reader's note, who died in 1727-8, to eight, the number of inhabitants was computed at about 500. End footnote. We abound with poor, many of whom are sober and industrious, and live comfortably in good stone or brick cottages, which are glazed, and have chambers above stairs. Mud buildings we have none. Beside the employment from husbandry, the men work in hop gardens, of which we have many, and fell and bark timber. In the spring and summer the women weed the corn, and enjoy a second harvest in September by hop-picking. Formerly, in the dead months, they availed themselves greatly by spinning wool, for making of barragons, a genteel corded stuff, much in vogue at that time for summer wear, and chiefly manufactured at Alton, a neighbouring town, by some of the people called Quakers. But from circumstances this trade is at an end. Footnote inserted by Gilbert White since the passage above was written, I am happy in being able to say that the spinning employment is a little revived, to the no small comfort of the industrious housewife. Return to text. The inhabitants enjoy a good share of health and longevity, and the parish swarms with children. Letter 6 to Thomas Pennant, Esquire Should I omit to describe with some exactness the forest of Walmer, of which three-fifths, perhaps, lie in this parish, my account of Selborne would be very imperfect, as it is a district abounding with many curious productions, both animal and vegetable, and has often afforded me much entertainment, both as a sportsman and as a naturalist. The Royal Forest of Walmer is a tract of land of about seven miles in length by two and a half in breadth, running nearly from north to south, and is abutted on to begin to the south, and so to proceed eastward, by the parishes of Greatham, Lys, Rogate, and Trotton, in the county of Sussex, by Bramshot, Headley, and Kingsley. This royalty consists entirely of sand covered with heath and fern, but is somewhat diversified with hills and dales, without having one standing tree in the whole extent. In the bottoms, where the waters stagnate, are many bogs, which formerly abounded with subterraneous trees, though Dr. Plot says positively, footnote, see his history of Staffordshire, end footnote, that there never were any fallen trees hidden in the mosses of the southern counties. But he was mistaken, for I myself have seen cottages on the verge of this wild district, whose timbers consisted of a black hard wood, looking like oak, which the owners assured me they procured from the bogs by probing the soil with spits or some such instruments. But the peat is so much cut out, and the moors have been so well examined, that none has been found of late. Besides the oak, I have also been shown pieces of fossil wood of a paler colour and softer nature, which the inhabitants called fir. But on a nice examination and trial by fire, I could discover nothing resinous in them, and therefore rather suppose that they were parts of a willow or alder, or some such aquatic tree. Footnote by Gilbert White Old people have assured me that on a winter's morning they have discovered these trees in the bogs by the hoar frost, 
which lay longer over the space where they were concealed than on the surrounding morass. Nor does this seem to be a fanciful notion, but consistent with true philosophy. Dr. Hales saith that the warmth of the earth at some depth underground has an influence in promoting a thaw, as well as the change of the weather from a freezing to a thawing state, is manifest from this observation, viz. November the twenty ninth, seventeen thirty one. A little snow having fallen in the night, it was by eleven the next morning mostly melted away on the surface of the earth, except in several places in Bushy Park, where there were drains dug and covered with earth, on which the snow continued to lie, whether those drains were full of water or dry, as also where elm pipes lay underground. A plain proof this that those drains intercepted the warmth of the earth from ascending from greater depths below them, for the snow lay where the drain had more than four feet depth of earth over it. It continued also to lie on thatch, tiles, and the tops of walls. See Hales's Hemostatics, page 360. Quaere. Might not such observations be reduced to domestic use? by promoting the discovery of old obliterated drains and wells about houses, and in Roman stations and camps lead to the findings of pavements, baths and graves, and other hidden relics of curious antiquity. End of Gilbert White's footnote. This lonely domain is a very agreeable haunt for many sorts of wild fowls, which not only frequent it in the winter, but breed there in the summer, such as lapwings, snipes, wild ducks, and, as I have discovered within these few years, teals. Partridges in vast plenty are bred in good seasons on the verge of this forest, into which they love to make excursions, and in particular, in the dry summer of 1740 and 1741, and some years after, they swarmed to such a degree that parties of unreasonable sportsmen killed twenty and sometimes thirty brace in a day. But there was a nobler species of game in this forest, now extinct, which I have heard old people say abounded much before shooting flying became so common, and that was the heathcock, black game, or grouse. When I was a little boy I recollect one coming now and then to my father's table. The last pack remembered was killed about thirty-five years ago, and within these ten years one solitary grey hen was sprung by some beagles in beating for a hare. The sportsman cried out, A hen pheasant! But a gentleman present, who had often seen grouse in the north of England, assured me it was a grey hen. Nor does the loss of our black game prove the only gap in the fauna selborniensis, for another beautiful link in the chain of beings is wanting. I mean the red deer, which toward the beginning of this century amounted to about five hundred head, and made a stately appearance. There is an old keeper, now alive, named Adams, whose great-grandfather, mentioned in the perambulation taken in 1635, grandfather, father, and self, enjoyed the head-keepership of Walmer Forest, in succession for more than an hundred years. This person assures me that his father has often told him that Queen Anne, as she was journeying on the Portsmouth Road, did not think the forest of Walmer beneath her royal regard, for she came out of the great road at Lippock, which is just by, and reposing herself on a bank smoothed for that purpose, lying about half a mile to the east of Walmer Pond, and still called Queen's Bank, saw with great complacency and satisfaction the whole herd of red deer brought by the keepers along the vale before her, consisting then of about five hundred head. A sight this worthy the attention of the greatest sovereign. But he further adds that, by means of the Waltham hacks, or to use his own expression, as soon as they began blacking. They were reduced to about fifty head, and so continued decreasing till the time of the late Duke of Cumberland. It is now more than thirty years ago that His Highness sent down an huntsman and six yeoman prickers in scarlet jackets laced with gold, attended by the staghounds, ordering them to take every deer in this forest alive and convey them in carts to Windsor, in the course of the summer they caught every stag, some of which showed extraordinary diversion, but in the following winter, when the hinds were also carried off, such fine chases were exhibited as served the country people for matters of talk and wonder for years afterwards. 
I saw myself one of the yeoman prickers single out a stag from the herd, and must confess that it was the most curious feat of activity I ever beheld, superior to anything in Mr. Astley's riding school. The exertions made by the horse and deer much exceeded all my expectations, though the former greatly excelled the latter in speed. When the devoted deer was separated from his companions, they gave him by their watches law, as they called it, for twenty minutes, when, sounding their horns, the stop-dogs were permitted to pursue, and a most gallant scene ensued. End of Letters Numbers 1-6 to six to Thomas Pennant, Esquire Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne